From our studios at the corner of 8th and Walton in Bensonville, Arkansas, welcome to Saturday Morning Meeting, where we cover Walmart, Sam's Club, and the consumer product companies that are represented on the racks and shelves throughout the country and around the world. I'm Derek Reidenauer, and our focus is on the insights, trends, and best practices to help you as a supplier grow your business with the world's largest retailer. Thank you for joining us, and today I will be talking with the grand prize winner in Walmart's 2013 Get on the Shelf campaign, and along with our weekly headline review, we'll highlight the top supplier and Walmart news of 2013, but first the headlines. Industry professionals and journalists alike spent much of 2013 speculating on current Walmart CEO Mike Duke's successor. Walmart ended their wait on November 25th by announcing that Doug McMillan, current head of Walmart International, would take Duke's place in February of 2014. Retail analyst Walter Loeb kicked a hornet's nest when he wrote a Forbes.com column blasting his local Walmart store for its disorganization, mess, and empty shelves. Loeb's remarks triggered response from Walmart, other analysts, and consumers. Eventually, Loeb's Walmart store got a new manager. Back in April, Retail Wire reported that Walmart was making it easier for suppliers to keep track of inventory. Walmart developed the Spark, also known as the Supplier Portal Allowing Retail Coverage smartphone app, which allows suppliers to access data directly from Walmart stores. Suppliers had a scare back in September when leaked emails indicated that Walmart planned to cut supplier orders. Bloomberg reported that Walmart was addressing inventory issues category by category. A sociology professor's articles on the five myths of Walmart for the Washington Post went viral in July. Rebecca Peoples Massengill's article wasn't as negative, though. Instead, the article addressed the social and economic impact of Walmart in a balanced way, sparking a lot of discussion about the world's largest retailer. Back in February, Pacific Standard offered up an analysis of how political affiliation might determine retail shopping preferences. Using the examples of Walmart and Trader Joe's, the article considered whether the preference for established brands, such as those offered at Walmart, could be connected to political conservatism. Walmart supply chain problems were big news this year. Bloomberg republished a story about the problem of empty shelves and out-of-stock merchandise back in February. The reports of inventory issues kept cropping up throughout 2013. In the wake of several deadly disasters in supplier factories, Walmart announced a zero-tolerance approach towards violations of safety standards by manufacturers. Walmart also announced that it would publicly name blacklisted factories that suppliers could not use to manufacture goods for Walmart. 2013 sales got off to a slow start, something that didn't escape the notice of some Walmart executives who frankly discussed the matter in emails that were later leaked to the press. Bloomberg reported in February that the leaked emails caused some panic amongst investors, leading to a stock decline. Check out Walmart and Supplier News as it's reported on walmartnewsnow.com. And we're joined now by our panel, Kobe Beeland from K-Stack, Andy Shook from Harvest, and Ross Culley from Harvest. Thanks, guys. The big stories of 2013, probably the mm -hmm. biggest one for Walmart, is that Doug McMillan got, got named CEO. We begin talking about this, I think a lot of people begin talking about this early in the year, even as early as shareholders, that Duke would probably be on the way out. Colby, what are your thoughts on Doug taking, out, taking over? Uh, wise choice. Um, I think with his international background uh, and where Walmart wants to go in the future, I think it was the most logical choice. I think his biggest challenge going forward is Amazon and e-commerce, and um, looking forward to seeing his, his growth and successes with Amazon. He was talking to a senior or director senior there senior. Um, a couple weeks ago, and, and he made a point that really since Sam, Doug is the first CEO of Walmart that's ever worked in a store. And let alone well, and he started. Didn't he start? He started off in a distribution he center, did. right? So lived, he lived in Bentonville. And, and uh, as as I think up. he started pushing carts in the parking lot. <laughs> oh, through, did he really? Yeah, in high yeah. school. I think he was pushing carts well, in the I, parking. I think that's a great story for all the critics of Walmart. You know, saying that you know you can't grow in this company. You can't come from the bottom and work your way up. If he's a great example of that, and I think I think that's going to be a great example for all the employees of Walmart to say, hey, right. if you work hard and you fit into the organization and go to school and go and do the things you need to do, you can work up through Walmart and have a very successful career. Because he wasn't born with a silver spoon in his mouth. I mean, he was, he's not part of the Walton family. He didn't come in with a high degree, started, worked his way up. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I think uh, that all that background feeds into what I think is one of his greatest strengths, which I think he's going to inspire and motivate the associates. Yep. He's a charismatic leader, and I think with all the challenges that Walmart has facing them, um, that's one of his greatest strengths and one of the uh, good reasons why I think it, he was a good choice. Mm. 
we'll see how that plays out. He's got a lot of challenges ahead of him, many of which Mike Duke faced, and obviously none of those challenges are going to go away simply because Doug takes over on February the 1st. Uh, one of the biggest challenges that, that I think all of us would agree on that Doug's going to have to kind of work through to resolve are uh, the in-stock issues or the overstock issues that we've seen the last half of the year. And then early this year, we had problems with messy stores. Walter Loeb uh, wrote an article in Forbes about how he was in a store in Massachusetts and just really trashed Walmart. And Andy, we were talking uh, about how we really haven't heard much from that since. No, you know, at the beginning of the year or during that time, um, and it was right after they had uh, the spring, right, where they had all, all kinds of inventory in the stores. But I think Walter's article was talking more about, you know, there was clothing laying on the floors. It just, it just wasn't taken care of. And, you know, we get kind of protected here in Northwest Arkansas, right? I mean, when we walk into a Walmart store, it's a totally different experience than what a lot of other people experience. And, and you know, I've got family that lives out in Minnesota and other places around the country, and they struggle shopping at Walmart because it's so messy at times. Right. But this last year, um, as the year went on, it seemed to get better. I mean, again, maybe we're not hearing as much about it, or maybe, you know, operations has come in and started doing some more merchandising and doing things with their employees with the stores and, and trying to get things cleaned the up. The labor still seems tight in the stores. And typically bad stores like that where you have freight on the floor or no freight at all comes down to lack of labor in the stores. And I think the Walmart's going to continue to focus on the labor. They yeah. have to, yeah. to, remain, to remain competitive. But it will be interesting to see how much they cut that labor and how much they really watch that. If Doug doesn't come in and say, we're understaffed in stores, and that begins his new direction if he changes Bill Simon and Giselle Ruiz and what the, where they're going with that. But it seems to have changed some. Well, they hired, what, 55,000 permanent employees, another 35,000 temporary employees, and they're talking about the 100,000 veterans. I mean, they're, they're, they're trying to bring more associates into the store, but the question is how far did they yeah. staff back, right. spread out over 4,000 stores to begin with? Well, it's all a formula. It's all connected, right? And so the slow sales that started the year, inventory piled up, labor gets cut, all of a sudden you have OSA issues, um, and then later in the year we have inventory issues. And so I think it used to be uh, if, you, if you shipped on time, and your in stock was at you know 98 percent. You were good if you're a supplier at Walmart. And I think it's gotten more complex than that. As they're dealing with macro issues with their performance and labor changes, suppliers are going to have to get more sophisticated about how to address OSA. And it's it's I think it's going going even further from fixing OSA to preventing OSA. And uh, I think suppliers are going to have to figure that out. Yeah. Well, and Walmart has moved to do that. Obviously, this year we've talked about uh, how they brought in uh, Acosta and they brought in the Crossmarks and the, the retail service organizations that have been there. And they also launched Spark later in the year. Mm -hmm. And Colby, you you have some numbers on how well Spark is doing for those stores where it has been active and where suppliers are actually utilizing it, or at least the suppliers, the the service companies are using it. I, I talked to some people today that are associated with it on the back end and. Um, there, currently, there's about 20,000 users of Spark. Um, it's not rolled out to 100% of suppliers. You have to go through an approval process. You can't just go out and buy the app on right. Apple App Store. You have to go through an approval process. A, whole, a lot of people have tried. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> me included. Um, but my understanding is the stores that oh, uh, that Spark has been used in, the, the push-through rate or sell-through rate on inventory has increased 3 to 30%. So mm -hmm. I think... When you put it all together, the, the real thing is Walmart shows they're the leader in the marketplace by collaborating with suppliers and continuing that collaborative effort right. to develop something that is going to improve OSA. And I mean, as, as the supplier community truly understands the power of Spark and realizes how it can benefit them and whether it's us utilizing a third party or hiring people in regions to utilize the app and go out and improve their, their performance so they have a higher OSA. Mm -hmm. It's going to be interesting to see how it all unfolds. So to your point, suppliers have got to get involved, and Spark is one way they can do that. Yeah, and uh, I think if Spark I is what it is now, then we've missed a, a huge opportunity. It needs to take the evolution of a retail link. It's not just check the box, we have it, but it really is going to have to be worked on and I think improved over the years. And, and you know, we've done some work with Spark and suppliers, and again, I, I think 
suppliers are going to look for an ROI on these dollars. And to go in and fix OSA, it's hard to get an ROI with the time and investment right. and labor. It's really the next level of evolution that we're working on is finding how do you prevent OSA using Spark and other analytic tools that we've developed. I think that's the next frontier. But how open is Walmart going to be to adding some of those costs in there? And you that's, know, that's, that's the yeah, question. that's yeah. the that is the hard question because um, there's no doubt that, that this initiative, one of the benefits to them is that as they adjust their labor, that suppliers take that onto the to their balance sheet and their P and L, and um, so it, it will be interesting to see how all these dynamics play out. As we moved along over this year, and we went from our out of stock situation, Spark obviously is helping to get some suppliers back in. What we saw in really in the fall is suppliers now, some suppliers were complaining that Walmart's slashing their orders and that they became over inventoried. Now here we are in the mm -hmm. last month of their fiscal year <coughs> when traditionally they do want to cut their inventory because beginning February 1st they have to report on everything and shareholders is coming up soon. What do we think, what do, what do you guys look ahead to see? Well first let's talk about what happened in the fall. Were they truly over inventoried or were they simply trying to hedge some bets? And if they were over inventoried, why? And Col Colby, I'll start with you because I know you ship a lot of stuff today. Sure. Well, there, there's so many moving parts here that it, we could talk about this for a long time. Um, it goes back to really 12 and the focus on OSA. And, and Bill Simons, I mean, publicly stating it is about having it on the shelf and, and, and the customer experience. So you see this transition over the year of getting ready for holiday sales OSA and product was arriving in the stores in September. Right. A lot of inventory was showing up in stores in September. Well, they had to cut inventory somewhere mm -hmm. to make space available for holiday sales. You had stuff for Christmas in the store before Halloween. It was an interesting dynamic that I haven't seen in, in a Walmart store before. So I think that happened or as a result because of the focus on OSA. Um, and but then you had issues with same store sales, mm -hmm. and there's higher mar my opinion. There's probably higher margin in holiday merchandise selling. Right. So the longer and, and they had a shorter s window to sell between Thanksgiving and Christmas. They had a, a week you think, shorter. I think they were planning, trying to get that out there early. I mean, Kmart started running, Kmart and Sears began running their ads in September, trying right. to get those consumers in there. So was this a a plan? that perhaps didn't go as well as they had hoped. Was it a plan to get the, the merchandise in there, try to get consumers in earlier to spend money before they had to do deep discounts in December, which right. is what we, we wind up seeing a lot of them do. Was it a bad plan or do you think it was no plan at all that kind of led to that? Well, the numbers will tell us here. In a week. Yeah, we'll, <laughs> we'll know that in a few weeks, won't we? <laughs> I don't know when. But you know, I, I think with, with everything that happened over the Christmas holidays with Target, and, you know, we talked about this a little bit, you know, a few weeks ago with the um, the credit card issue that they had or whatnot. Which they're still having some issues. I know, I know. And, I mean, well, Walmart benefited from that, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I'm sure some other retailers did as well, but Walmart had to have benefited from that. Mm -hmm. So hopefully they've gutted themselves and they, you know, they're running out of product and they need to order more product in during the month of January. But the second thing is, is the, the um, we were talking about earlier, the, uh, um, the Amazon.coms, the dot-coms of the world, they got all of these additional orders, maybe because of some of what happened at Target or happened, you know, or customers didn't want to go out and shop the stores. They thought, I'm going to try dot-com this right. year, but they didn't get their gifts. You know, you were, you were saying, you, know, you were talking about, right. you know, trying to ship stuff to, and, and it was, you know, four, five, six days late. Right. And, you know, you're, it'll be interesting to see how that's going to affect um, sales over this next year, in 2014 at Christmas. In 2014, yeah. next year, Will consumers who did not get their gifts there on time say, you know what, I'm not going to take that chance? Right. And they're going to go back to the box retailer and say, well, I know well, it's there e and e I know I can sell up, it. From the numbers that I saw, up about 21% over last year, right. which were some really good numbers. Now, yeah. there are a couple of things I think that Target, obviously, their meltdown did not did not help big box retailers. Uh, shorter shopping season. Yeah. But we also had a lot of bad weather that kind of kept some consumers in. It's easier to go and shop online than, than it is to try to get to the big box retailers. But you're, it's a good point. What, what's going to happen next year? Have a longer shopping season. Mm -hmm. Is e-commerce going to be down or, or flat next year? Because they're coming out around a 21% increase, so we'll, it'll be interesting to see what happens. Ross? Yeah, I think the other thing around inventory that we can't forget is assortment. And so Walmart added back all that assortment, you know, over a year ago. And so when you when you do that, there's an element of which that impacts all these levers as well. OSA, there's 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 a lot of large suppliers that are arguing 
give me that space on the shelf from those small brands because I need right. it for OSI. Uh, that's inventory you don't need to carry, Mr. and Mrs. Retailer. So, you know, depending on where you're at on that side of the spectrum, um, assortment could be another thing that comes around that we're talking about this year relative to OSA and inventory. Okay, we've got just a couple of minutes left. Big takeaways uh, for Walmart. I want to go around to each of you as we get full, as we look to the end of this year and look into next year, what are some key things that we should be watching for, certainly as a supplier and kind of be aware of, and we're going to be talking with some people in the coming weeks about that, but Ross, I'll, I'll come back to you. What are some big things that, as a supplier, I need to be focused on going into 2014? I think um, you, you've got to know your reason for being, you know, back to that assortment. I think there's, there, there, there's going to be a heavy look at each category of why brands and items need to be there. You need to understand your consumer. I think when you look at the trend of big data just in business, I think for CPG and retailers, there's a big opportunity to understand who's my consumer. And then when it gets down to the executional elements, because of some of the, the things that Walmart's going through, I think execution in store is becoming more and more a concern for suppliers. So you, they need to be a student of what, what, what happens with my merchandise when I ship it all the way to the shelf. And I, I may need to budget some money uh, to make sure that it gets there. Okay. Colby? Uh, I, I agree with exactly what Ross said. I, I think the one thing is a lot of suppliers are done when it hits the D.C. I mean, it's just the typical thing. Is, oh, I got it to the I got D.C. It there. I got my D.C. I, I, I hit my MABD. Yeah. I'm yeah. good. Let, you know, let, let's move on. But I think one of the real issues with the inventory on the stock, the the <laughs> inventory being on the shelf is um, the, the lack of execution or store execution from DC to store. And whose fault is that, whether it's a supplier or Walmart or a combination of the two, has been the biggest challenge. And right. it's impacted on, on shelf availability, but it's also just impacted the, the messy store look. It's not necessarily a messy store look, but when you go into a store and it looks like they're bank going, going out of business because Right. The shelves, shelves are, are completely there. just yeah. decimated of product. Um, I still think there's a lot of figuring out between the supplier and Walmart of how this is going to flow and who's how how are they going to improve it. So as a supplier, you've got to figure it out. You've got to mm -hmm. be focused on it, and you got to be asking Walmart. You you got to be prepared to ask those questions with Walmart of what are we doing to fix it? What can we do together? Right. How can we collaborate to improve this? Spark is a, is a start, but as you said, there's a cost to it, and who's going to bear it? And it's in limited distribution or limited availability at this point. Yeah. Well, you know, I think 2013 was was a big transitional year for the buyers um, when they got IRI Nielsen and they started really looking at the data much more closely. And, and Ross, to your point, I think the the suppliers need to be more savvy with the way in which they deal with Walmart. Um, if they've got business already at Walmart, Sam's Club, they need to understand retail link, the data, um, the MEBDs, and all of the things that they're supposed to be doing and and taking a look at that and being able to add value back to that buyer with their brand and the knowledge that they have behind their brand. I think if they can do those things, I mean, it, it's, it's something we've, we've talked about before on this right. show is, is you can't just go in and get that PO and go ship it and you're done. There's, there's so much more that they've, they've got to bring to those buyers about what's really happening with the category. Let's see it all the way through. Yeah. All right, gentlemen, thank you very much. We are out of time for now. But when we come back, we're going to talk with two brand new suppliers to Walmart as they won Walmart's Get On The Shelf program this year. We'll find out what they did and what their items are coming up when Saturday Morning Meeting continues. GigWalk is an on-demand mobile workforce that can collect data and do work at retail. Businesses use GigWalk for retail audits, merchandising, and much more. With 350,000 smartphone-enabled workers available on-demand, you get unprecedented speed and coverage across the U.S., Canada, and the U.K. And all work is reviewed for quality and accuracy. Visit GigWalk.com to learn more. You know, the biggest challenge of working with Walmart is they really expect everyone on the team to know their language, know their terminology, and know exactly how they do business. So that's where Ethan Walton really comes into play. You know, it's the fastest way to get my team members up to speed. Their business model is suppliers teaching suppliers. So when you come to Ethan Walton, you can count on having very experienced trainers who understand how suppliers work within Walmart, and they take advantage of that and incorporate that into their curriculum. Welcome back to Saturday Morning Meeting. Walmart recently had its Get On The Shelf program and had two winners. Joining me now, live from Richmond, Virginia, is Tumi Orton. And Tumi, you developed something a little bit unique, a bracelet for kids. So what was your inspiration I... for developing that? 
Oh yeah, I developed Scripps customizable wristbands, and the inspiration for developing it was one of two reasons. Um, I thought back to when I was a kid and how much I just loved to create at all times, and I just felt like I, I just loved the ability to be able to draw wherever I was as a kid, like if I was in the car, even if I was at school. So I felt like it would be cool in that aspect. And the other reason was I just loved the ability um, to customize my own message instead of having to, I guess, adapt to whatever. Um, types of wristbands were available in the public, so I just felt like there would be a great opportunity for a customizable wristband out there in the world. So as you were going through this, did you ever think that you would, I mean obviously you thought you would be a winner, you wouldn't have submitted it, but what are some things that, looking back now, that you really wish you would have known before you started this big adventure? I wish I would have known, I guess, the um, extensive amount of work and just, um, just sweat equity that was involved in this type of effort. I, I learned about the competition almost by luck. I was in this um, invention meeting, inventors meeting in Richmond here locally, and I found out about it like a week before the deadline was due. So I had to hustle and get some people to actually help me make the video, and then I just submitted it and just um, just thought, what well, like let's see what happens. And I ended up here, so it's been pretty awesome thus far. So what are, what are the next steps for your bracelet? All right, so the next steps are we're working on um, getting the initial orders for Walmart.com ready, and hopefully we're going to expand um, into Walmart retail, retail stores um, in the near future. And we're just trying to make sure that we're ramped up for any sort of processes that are coming up, um, making sure the manufacturing is done, making sure that our packaging is um, um, meeting all the safety requirements and things of that nature. So do we, can we look for any uh, line extensions and some new items as this takes off? Definitely. Um, I'm currently working with a company called Baby Fanatic, and um, what they do is they make um, licensed baby products like baby binkies and bibs and stuff like that. So along with different colors and patterns, hopefully later in 2014 or early in 2015, we can have some sports license um, scripts as well. Very good. And then if somebody is looking or somebody watching this and they're thinking that they want to get involved with this next year or next time it comes around, what are some things that you would tell them to make life better for them and, and in terms of, of all the work you have to do? But yeah. also, what are you going to tell them how to win? Um, what I would tell somebody who's trying to enter the competition is really make sure that you have your resources lined up. I kind of went out about it as, I felt like I was one of the newer companies in the competition and I was just going off of a good idea. And I was able to complete the contest and win the, win, like partially win the competition because of just the amount of work I had to put into it. But I know if you have your ducks in a row prior, it just makes life a lot easier. I know a lot of the other contestants weren't as stressed out as I was because they already had like their vendor and onboarding like process set up. So I, I was brand new to it, so I had to get all that stuff set up. And I guess to win the competition, the main thing that I noticed when I was, um, I guess, trying to like track the awareness, I noticed that the amount of PR push that I got really helped. The amount of just legwork I did, going to places, just like going to radio stations, knocking on doors, saying, hey, can I do an interview, stuff like that. Just trying to get, especially the local buzz going, some national buzz, um, hitting up local like mommy bloggers, toy bloggers, just to get the word out. Um, and to the relevant audience, I think was the biggest deal. Like the, so I definitely noticed that the amount of public awareness I got based on press was higher than the other um, competitors. So I'm guessing you're not a PR person. Not at all. I'm, I'm I'm a master student in product innovation. We learn a general sense of how to uh, pursue our products, but a lot of it was honestly just intuition on how I need to put this product forward, like who I need to talk to, just making sure I tapped into the right resources. Because I knew, I, I guess I'm very aware of what I don't know, so I wanted to make right. sure I tapped into people who do know what they're doing. So is Walmart giving you any indication um, of when it will be on store shelves? On store shelves, no. Um, they're going to be available for um, regular order on Walmart.com as of January 1st, but they're available for pre-order now. I guess with Walmart, um, we're going to just see how the sales do online, of course, and hopefully that will... Um, have like store managers and stuff to try to pull them into their stores. All right, and in the meantime, they can certainly go to walmart.com and get the pre-orders. And when do you think they'll start shipping? Um, they're going to start shipping January 1st. Okay. Um, we're trying to move it up. Um, hopefully, it would be lovely to have it, I guess, for Christmas. But right now, like the set date is January 1st. Well, there's always Easter. And you're <laughs> in the under $40 category, so very affordable item uh, yes. you can get there. And again, they can pre-order those right now at walmart.com. Yes, sir. Right. Well, Timmy, thank you very much for joining us. We appreciate you taking the time out 
uh, this morning. And when we come back on Saturday morning meeting, we are going to talk with the other Get on the Shelf winner in the over $40 category. You don't want to miss it. It's all coming up as Saturday morning meeting continues. Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art, we can help your business meetings get out of the box. Way, way out of the box. With refreshing views of the museum's 120 acre grounds, breathtaking architecture, spacious meeting and presentation venues, and top notch catering from Eleven, our award winning restaurant, not to mention more than 400 works of art by American masters. Your meeting at Crystal Bridges will be anything but in the box. Call us today and let our team of professional event planners arrange your next meeting at Crystal Bridges Museum of American art. I would recommend Eighth and Walton to other suppliers because from my experience talking to other suppliers, they were even learning new ideas or just new and better business practices. Most people have little time for training and so Eighth and Walton is a perfect opportunity to send your new employees to understand the retailing system. And again, because trainers were suppliers, they know the how and the why, so they become very valuable very quickly. Welcome back to Saturday Morning Meeting, continuing our conversation with the Get On The Shelf winners. Joining me now by the telephone is David Burstein. David was the winner of the uh, over $40 category, and David, you had uh, Elvis Presley betting. Tell me about how, your, your inspiration for that product. Uh, our inspiration for the product, of course, was Elvis Presley himself. Uh, I've been a longtime Elvis Presley fan, and my business partner, who also is the designer of the bedding, had a, um, an idea to put bedding on a bed that would be beautiful enough to hang on a wall. So, cumulatively, we put our two heads together and came up with the Elvis Presley bedding collection. So, if you were going to do this all over again, what are some things that you really wish you would have known, and what were some of the challenges that you experienced during this process of Get on the Shelf with Walmart? Uh, actually, if I had to do the Get on the Shelf with Walmart um, project all over again, I would do it exactly the way we did it, um, maybe with a few exceptions. But um, we never really realized what kind of success we would have, and it was just um, it, it phenomenal to us that uh, the success was... Um, was so high and um, the consumer's acceptance of the product was so high and the boating and everything. So I would say that, um, that without re really knowing it, by mistake, we actually did it the right way. So if, if for somebody who, who may be watching now anticipating getting their, their great idea that they have and they're going to enter this program next year and try to get on the shelf, what are some key things that you would have them do? Uh, from the Walmart side or from the side of the um, the participants from the side of the uh, participant what should they be thinking of now and what are some of the plans that they so should begin to social media um, I think we were lucky enough to have Elvis Presley's Facebook fans which is uh, somewhere near 10 million um, that it was a very loyal audience to Elvis Presley that really propelled us with the voting process and so I would say um, being prepared for social media is probably key um, but between my partner and myself, there's a, there's a big age difference, and she grew up in the technology era. I'm a little bit old school, so with, uh, together we came up with something that um, was, was a good executed plan with social media. So what are the next steps for you? The next steps for us is uh, to get into Bentonville and to uh, meet with the Walmart buying team and see if we can put together a good program and get some brick and mortar distribution. And for us as a company, of course, it's to um, see if we can put other American legends on the shelf of Walmart stores. Uh, in the near future, we're doing a line of pillow shams themed to Alice Presley songs made in the USA. So what are some of the others? I, I obviously don't want you to give away anything too secretive here, but what are some of the other icons that you plan on focusing on? Uh, well, I, I would say the answer to that question is if you can think of who the most um, famous icons are in your mind, those are the ones we want. Um, <laughs> so, uh, right now, your your items are available at Walmart.com. Is that correct? Yes. Or you can pre-order. And they're pre-selling. Um, we have one style listed. We have two styles available. They'll be adding the second style soon. We're we're selling a style called Elvis Presley guitars, and it's right now it's, it's on a pre-book basis. So. Um, We've, we've basically sold out of our Christmas inventory, and now we're just um, pre-buying on, on Walmart.com. 
Have they given you any idea on how many how many stores they could possibly put you in? If they, obviously things are going well, you've sold out. Um, any idea of, of where those stores may be for customers no, who want to get outsourced? No, um, they haven't given us any idea of that. I've read a lot of uh, what, what took place last year and what happened to the winners last year. But again, this was a different model than last year because of the webisodes. Um, okay. and, the, and the, I think the voting process and the pre buy process. So I really don't know what's in store, but um, as far as I'm concerned, it, it can only be positive. All right, and then what are some of the biggest challenges that you face right now? I mean, obviously you are, you're out of stock and, or you've sold out of your pre-orders. Uh, what do you see as some of the bigger challenges for you going forward as a company? I would say the biggest challenges for us as a company is probably um, experiencing some growing pains. Uh, we've been kind of doing everything ourselves uh, between two people, uh, shopping some outside services, and um, what will happen next is we'll, we'll have to take the next step into um, assembling ourselves as a, as a company and, and hire people and bring aboard um, good, good help and uh, start expanding that way. Have any other retailers contacted you and try, wanting to, to kind of get in on this as well? I would like to get on the shelves of all the major um, discounters and mass merchants. But right now we're putting uh, a lot of bags into the Walmart basket, and um, I think it's a good basket to be in. Okay. So like I said, when I presented the product, um, there's no better way to get distribution from the king of rock and roll than by the king of retail. Very good. Well, David Burstein, founder of, uh, or winner of Get on the Shelf program with the uh, over 40 category, the Elvis Presley uh, betting. David, thank you for joining us. And when we come back, we will conclude Saturday morning meeting. Cameron Smith & Associates is supplier's first choice in recruiting the competitive Walmart supplier job market. We connect qualified candidates to CPG jobs in Northwest Arkansas and across the country. CSA also sources sales and marketing professionals for companies providing advertising, marketing, merchandising, and data management services to suppliers. Contact us today at csarecruiters.com. Today's show has been sponsored in part by 8th and Walton, the premier destination for Walmart supplier education. 8th and Walton offers a variety of services including new supplier onboarding, scorecard optimization, and analysis and reporting. Visit 8thandwalton.com forward slash services to learn more. Thank you for taking your time and joining us today. If you have questions or comments, we would love to hear from you. And join us next week when our featured guest will be Vic Miles from Microsoft. I'm Derek Reidenauer, and for all of us at Saturday Morning Meeting, thanks for watching.